Reverend Susan Sparks wrote a book called Laughing Your Way to Grace, and she had this story. My dad, Herb, was a man who believed in being overly prepared, especially when it came to cars. He was actually one of the first in our neighborhood to sport a low rider, not because the suspension had been modified like most classic low riders, but because of the inordinate amount of roadside assistance items that he carried in the trunk. Tucked neatly away in the cavernous trunk of his 1964 baby blue Buick LeSabre were three golf umbrellas, two totes rain hats, several sets of emergency flashers, a road atlas from 1952, three toolboxes, an extra spare tire, and of course chains and an aluminum space blanket. These were in case he encountered a blizzard in the .3-mile drive from his home to his office, his office in Charlotte, North Carolina. (laughs) She said, most of us tend to be on the herb side, carrying around things we don't really need, weighing ourselves down with unnecessary baggage, going through life like low riders. Susan Sparks implies that all of us have more than we really need to embark on a journey. As I read her story, I thought of the process her father went through in order to prepare for a journey, how it was part preparation and part fear that the path ahead might go wrong somewhere along the way. Every year, at the end about this time of year, and at Just at the dawn of the next year, I think about the past and gear up for the future. I think about the season and all the holidays that hit, the holy days, and they prompt me often to think about journeys. If you were told you needed to leave immediately, what would you pack? Of course, I don't need to tell many of you this, right? Because Those of us who live here in Florida know that any moment's notice, a hurricane could be headed in our direction, but we often get two or three days' notice, often. Everything stops. It's a hold-up moment when it's like no normal routines. All of them subside and evacuation is imminent. We have hurricanes that force all of us to prepare, but we get a few days' warning. Imagine what the people in conflict war-torn countries are experiencing. I know most of us have been thinking about them lately. As you know, tonight is the fourth night of Hanukkah. On so many levels, the old story has more relevance than ever. Do you recall the ancient story about how a group of people were forced to leave their cherished homeland and then they returned? The story is about suffering and sacrifice and facing fear and the rewards of doing the difficult work of rebuilding. Author Morris Epstein wrote, When it comes to tales of dauntless courage and spirit in the face of overwhelming odds, Hanukkah is one of the oldest saga. Many people forget to talk about the earliest origins. Now, you have all heard about the Maccabees, but did you know that there was a woman, Hannah, involved in the earliest days with seven sons? They were all summoned by the tyrannical king of Syria, Antiochus Epiphanes. The king demanded that each son give up their faith and bow down to a Greek statue of Zeus. Frightened and fully aware of the power of the king, Hannah stood with her cherished sons and watched as each one refused to bow down to relinquish their Jewish faith. Each son was subsequently led to his death. This is heart-wrenching material. And the last, her youngest son, came before the king. As they were taking him away, she collapsed and died, and her spirit went to be with her sons. It's a beautiful story, sad. But the old story explains that when Hannah's soul flew instantly to heaven, she was permitted to share everlasting life with her treasured children. Also was recorded about how angry Antiochus got at witnessing the commitment of the Jewish people to their faith. 
he became more fierce and more angry, so much so that he sent his soldiers to destroy the temple. In a small town located a few miles away, a father and his five sons created a private militia, a band of men who agreed to fight the evil king's army. They made preparations and went to battle with the king's soldiers. After much fighting, a final encounter occurred when more of the king's soldiers' troops arrived in the town of Emmaus, where villagers who were led by Judah Maccabee and his five sons had been organizing in order to fight and to finally defeat King Atiak's forces. I know you've heard this story. I think it's important that we tell stories about people of the past who mustered courage and bravery and a commitment to their faith. In 165 BCE, the Jews returned to Jerusalem. They entered their beloved temple and found it dismantled and in disarray. Greek statues had been erected, and the sacred scrolls of the Torah had been torn and scattered about. Soon, however, the people set about scrubbing and cleaning the temple. This is the beginning of the traditional tale. However, I need to tell you about a contemporary author a woman, Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, in a book titled My Grandfather's Blessings. If you have not come across this book, it's powerful. She shared the true account of her own discussion of Hanukkah as she was a child. She went to her father's house daily after school while her mother worked. Rachel wrote about that experience she had when she was, get this, in first grade. She said her teacher at school talked about Hanukkah and the Maccabees, the fierce Jewish warriors who had long ago fought a great battle to defend the Jewish people, who fought on until all provisions had run out. Even the oil for the eternal lamp was so low that the people thought that the end of the world was near. And how they used the last of the oil and found it had burned for eight days, much longer than estimated, and how the Maccabees took it as a sign that God was on their side. But listen to this. Young Rachel was upset by the focus on the war, and she was troubled that God had played favorites. So she asked her grandfather, a rabbi, about Hanukkah. This is beautiful. She wrote that he responded, Tonight is the first night of Hanukkah, he said, and so we will light one candle. He took up his Bible and he opened it to the first page. He said, The oldest story about darkness and light is the story about the beginning of the world. He told me. This is Raymond, Dr. Raymond, who said. And he began to read this. In the beginning, darkness was over the waters, and the Spirit of God moved in the darkness like a great wind over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. I looked at my grandfather, she said, his face shining with the power of these words. I was enthralled. This is how the world begins, Nishumli, he said. To me, life and all its blessing begin with God's gift of light. Now, he said, I'm going to turn out the lamps and there will be darkness like there was in the beginning. We're going to see what it's like to receive this gift. Ray, um, Naomi wrote, I was afraid of the dark, terrified of the dark. We were in this room in the library where there were no windows, no light, and I didn't want him to turn out the light. I said, will you stay right here with me in the dark, Grandpa? He said, of course, Nishumli, I will be here and God will be here too. Tell me when you're ready to start. When I nodded, my grandfather reached behind him and turned out both the lamps. When I nodded, the old, when he turned out the lights, the old study was completely black. It was lined to floor, from floor to ceiling with books, no windows, dark indeed. After a moment or so, my grandfather struck a candle and lit the one I was holding. It did not give much light, and I could barely make out the menorah on the table. The rest of the room was filled with shadows. I held on to my candle tightly. Pointing to the single candle in the menorah, he told me to light it with my candle. Then he took my candle from me and placed it in the menorah too. I looked at the two candles burning together and felt a little better. He said, tomorrow we will light another one. The next afternoon, as we sat at sunset, we talked. And again, my grandfather had placed two candles in the great candlestick. And when he lit my candle this, 
this time, I carefully lit the two candles from its flame, the first and the other, and we sat there watching the three candles burning. We did this every day for a week. As the days went by, I lit three, then four, and on the final day, I lit all seven candles with my candle, and the room was filled with light. I sat back and looked at the menorah with all the candles burning. It was so beautiful that my heart ached and my eyes filled with tears. I said, Grandpa, this is beautiful. He said, but God's menorah is even more beautiful, Nishimli. And this is what drew me to this story. God's menorah is made of people, not candles. Puzzled, I turned to him. The story of Hanukkah, he said, is that God's light burns in the darkness even without oil, and it is so. That is one of the miracles. But there is more. There is a place in every person that can carry the light. God has made us this way. And when God said, let there be light, he was speaking to us personally. He is telling us what is possible, how we might choose to live, but one candle does not do much in the darkness. God has not only given us the chance to carry light, said Naomi. He made it possible for us to kindle and strengthen the light in one another, passing the light along. This is the way that the divine light will shine forever in this world. After many years, she said, I have found that often we discover the place in us that carries the light only after it has become dark. We notice it. Sometimes it is only in the dark that we know the value of this place. But there is a place in every person that carries the light. This is true. My grandfather said so. I cherish that story. It's beautiful. It's a rabbi saying it's not just about the literal sense. It's about the idea that we each carry a flame, perhaps the chalice flame that we light every week. But here's another thing. Reverend Dan Schatz, he's a UU minister. He said, where I came to was the story in the Maccabees, the story of the aftermath of the terrible civil war. In rededicating the temple, the Maccabees also had to embark on a journey to rededicate themselves from war-making to peace-making. They had been fighting for what they saw as the purity of their religion. But at the end of all of that, the people still had to learn to live with each other and be a society together. Maybe it just took a little time for that kind of rededication to begin. Maybe in that time, they stopped looking at what had been and started to think about how to create one community together again. In the end, they found ways to come together, the people, and move forward as one people. The situation is not exactly the same as today, what is happening in Israel, the Palestine, of course. But still, in the end, the people who are fighting right now need to find ways to live together in peace. There will still need to be a rededication of the heart. Every year, I ask myself, where is my rededication of the heart? In 2020, in the United States, in an aftermath of a very tough four years, I remember that feeling of, can I have trust again in our politicians? I rededicate myself every year about this time to faith and hope in the future a rededication of the heart, to be asked again for every person to consider this time of year as an opportunity to rededicate the heart to hope and renewal and away from a mindset that remains stuck in outdated thought patterns. I know here in the United States, as we all prepare for the year in front of us, including the elections, I invite you to rededicate your heart to hope and not total despair. I am so grateful by, for these words by Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who pointed out a few other inspiring thoughts about Hanukkah. He said, we can change the world. That's one med- message about Hanukkah. We can change the world. So it was with the Maccabees all these long years ago. The Maccabees fought for their religious freedom, winning a stunning victory against the most powerful army of the ancient world. He said... The light of the spirit never dies. This is a beautiful metaphor. Why did they search for oil in the first place when they arrived at the ruined temple? Because 
their faith was so strong from the worst tragedy something would survive. The miracle of the first night was that of faith itself. The faith that something would remain with which to begin again. Hanukkah is about one of the first great clashes of civilization between the Greeks and the Jews of antiquity. Tragic cultures eventually disintegrate and die. Judaism and its culture of hope survived, and the Hanukkah lights are a symbol for that survival. Finally, I'm going to share a clip with you by Rabbi Gary Oren, and it's another beautiful interpretation and thoughts of Hanukkah. Can you play that right There's now? There's a story from the Holocaust, actually, that, that um, the father and the son returned return together, and, and um, the father, father had saved, saved a bit of margarine, margarine that they, they had given, given get a wrap, wrap and some small foil. foil. He took, took it, it out one night, and he put a wick in it that he had made, and they, they light, light it and say the blessings, blessings for the first night of Hanukkah. And the son gets really, really angry at the father. He says, Dad, how can you do this? Like here, here you, you can't, can't waste any food. food. The father turns, turns to the son and says, this is here in this place, the most horrible place we've learned, learned that you can, you can go three, three days without water. water. You can go, you can go three, three weeks without food. food. You, you can't, can't last three minutes without hope. The Khan says about hope. No matter what the world looks like today, can look like something else tomorrow. The uh, humans, humans banding together, doing for good, good, taking God's, God's ideas and reflecting them out into the world. When, when darkness, darkness comes upon us, there is only, only one thing I know that pushes that darkness away, away and that's, that's love. love. That's, that's it. it. Part of that, the rabbi was soft-spoken. He told a story, a uh, true story, that happened during the Holocaust when a father and son had a tiny bit of oil in a little piece of aluminum foil, and the father put a wick in the oil and lit it, and the son said, we don't have much. Why are you wasting the precious food that we have, the oil that we have? And the father said, you can live three days without water, three weeks without food, but you cannot live without hope. I thought that was a beautiful reminder. May we choose to hold on to hope in the days ahead. May it be so, and blessed be.